Good morning. I'm Craig Boyce, Dean of Syracuse University College of Law, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first full day of our two-day virtual symposium, Deaccessioning After 2020. I don't have to tell you how important this topic has become to museums across the country. Many of them are struggling to overcome the twin obstacles of a pandemic that has devastated museum attendance and a fundamentally unsustainable business model. Directors and trustees are looking for answers to difficult questions about fiscal solvency, equitable employment practices, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the appropriate role of cultural institutions in the 21st century. I serve as vice chair of the board of trustees at the Everson Museum here in Syracuse. And in that role, I've spent many, many hours wrestling with these issues along with my board colleagues, all of whom are passionate about art and artists and the role that they can play in elevating our community. Our deaccessioning of a Jackson Pollock painting last year was motivated both by our desire to ensure that we're able to properly care for the Everson's collection of 10,000 works of art and by the question of how we could possibly elevate our community with an art collection that for the most part omitted the historical contributions and experience of anyone who is not white and male. For our actions, we have been derided by some critics, commentators, and bloggers, most of whom have never been to the Everson, know little about our history, our mission, or our collection, and nothing about the Syracuse community. We know that we are not alone in this experience, and knowing that there are many other museums across the country facing existential questions about their futures and unsure about how to navigate them, we felt that it was time for a candid and broad discussion about museums their purpose, their survival, and the role of deaccessioning in these issues. So here we are. I wanna thank my Syracuse University colleagues, Professor of Museum Studies and Interim Director of the School of Design, Emily Stokes-Reese, and Professor of Museum Studies and the Director of the Museum Studies Program, Andrew Saluti, for embracing the idea for this symposium and taking a lead role in putting it together. I'd also like to thank attorney Mark Gold, who's the Everson's outside counsel for using his many connections in the museum world to help pull the symposium together. A number of sponsors have supported the symposium financially and we deeply appreciate their commitment to this conversation. The Association of Midwest Museums, the Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums, the Southeastern Museums Conference, the Western Museums Association, the Museum Trustee Association and the Museum Association of New York. Thank you for your support. We'd also like to acknowledge the Humanities Center and the University Lecture Series at Syracuse Uni University for their support. We deeply appreciate it. We have an all-star and broadly representative group of speakers and panelists, and we're grateful for the time they've taken to join us and for their willingness to share their thoughts grounded in many years of combined experience in the museum world. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you who've joined us to be part of this important conversation. You represent virtually every type of museum from regional to national, to presidential museums, to the Motorcyclopedia Museum here in New York. That is a destination I'll soon visit. Some entire museum studies classes are with us today. Hello, Western Illinois University. And those participating hail from all across the country, from Hawaii to Maine, from Alaska to Puerto Rico and from around the globe, including from Spain, the United Arab Emirates and New Zealand. Welcome to all of you. When we began to plan for these two days, little did we know that more than 1100 of you would spend this time with us. We hope that you find the discussions over the next two days to be useful, insightful and relevant to your work. Please remember that to join each of the sessions in the next two days, you must use the dedicated link for that session. Those links are in the symposium agenda, which you were sent and should have in PDF format. If you have trouble logging in, please email Carly, that's K-A-R-L-Y, at kmgproductionsny.com. I'll repeat that, Carly, K-A-R-L-Y, at kmgproductionsny.com. 
I want to remind you that live captioning is available throughout the event. And in addition, we are recording all sessions and we'll make those available to you in the coming weeks. And now I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker. Kaywin Feldman is the fifth director of the National Gallery of Art and the first woman to hold this important national position. Prior to joining the gallery, Kaywin led the Minneapolis Institute of Art as its Niven and Duncan McDillon director and president. During that time, she doubled attendance, expanded the collection, launched and completed visionary strategic plans and transformed the museum's relationship to the Twin City community and to the nation through groundbreaking initiatives such as the Center for Empathy and the Visual Arts. Kaywin is a trustee of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the White House Historical Association, and the Chipstone Foundation, and she's a member of the State Hermitage Museum International Advisory Board. She's a past president of the Association of Art Museum Directors and past chair of the American Alliance of Museums. She's lectured widely and published numerous articles on many aspects of museums in the 21st century. Welcome, Kaywin. Thank you and good morning. I think the organizers of the conference invited me to deliver a keynote because they know I am not afraid to speak my mind on controversial subjects. I will cut to the chase. I don't have a controversial point of view on deaccessioning and the National Gallery does not deaccession. Having directed four museums, sized, small, medium and large in four different regions of the country my feelings about the use of proceeds from deaccessioning come from previous experience. My point of view is conservative, formed by running small museums during earlier financial crises. On each occasion, if I had told the board we could sell something of the collection to balance the budget, they would have done so in a heartbeat. Armed with the AMD guidelines, we soldiered on, figured it out, and raised the necessary money. Having said that, I do believe that if museum leadership truly thinks they have exhausted all options and must sell works or close their doors, far be it from me to judge them. I don't find the deaccessioning topic all that interesting, as I believe we are only looking at the shiny tip of the iceberg peeking out of the sea of pressing issues ignoring the very real mass of danger threatening below the surface. Deaccessioning de is perhaps the wrong answer to the wrong question. Museums are reactionary institutions and glacial in embracing change. In many cases, this slow pace of change has protected museums and ensured their longevity. But today, with the increasing acceleration of change, the status quo is the riskiest place to be. Pro processes of industrialization, demographic change, technological innovation, and human-induced environmental destruction all occurred more rapidly in the last 20 years than ever before. Societal transformation is now happening at an exponential rate globally. Most importantly for museums, these changes are leading to modified behavior in our audiences. Treat my comments today as a public confession, for I am just as guilty as anyone else for perpetuating the outmoded behavior that got us into this mess. I do not hold myself out as a shining example of new behavior. Shortly after the storming of the Capitol, I sat down to write my weekly message to the staff and I just couldn't do it. I was empty. I could not stare down yet another crisis while letting the staff know it was gonna be okay. As soon as I came into the gallery and saw our team working on a colorful contemporary art installation in the East Building, I recentered on our mission and I found my optimism again and the words to express it. But I vowed not to forget the burden of a year of multiple crises that coalesced into one big weight that presses down on all of us. We have tended to treat the pandemic, the economic crisis, and the protests around systemic racism as separate incidents. 
One year in, I have learned that these crises are all linked. The pandemic, economic inequality, continued racial terror, and civil unrest are related and all result from the cumulative strain of environmental and public health crises coupled with economic inequality and the urgent need for social justice. And tragically, in America, the effect of these compounded crises have impacted women and communities of Black, Indigenous, and people of color more than others. In decisions about matters small and great, leaders must come from a place of empathy, internalizing what they hear through intentional listening and considering how the stresses of these times affect people differently. In my time with you today, I'm going to address briefly the three primary strains that I think have led to the deaccessioning discussion and a time of relentless strain on American museums. Unstable growth coupled with undercapitalization, an existential environmental crisis, and a reluctance to make meaningful changes in order to embrace ever evolving American demographics. The 20th century was the century of the growth of museums. With Europe as a model, every great American city had to have an orchestra, a zoo, a library, and an art museum. Over the course of the century, we built museums, grew our collections, expanded our museums and our staffs grew and audiences grew. Growth has been the primary driver of American museums for the last 70 years, and it remains so today. The extraordinary generosity and commitment of American philanthropists and the vision of the great leaders who preceded us means that America is filled with significant art museums, housing expansive collections in grand buildings and making a difference in their communities. Art museums cannot, however, continue to expand at this same level of growth because we are undercapitalized. Most of us have filled our available grounds with buildings, likely in need of deferred maintenance. Our galleries are packed with art and lack of storage has become a crisis for most of us. Each year, we balance our operating budgets on razor thin margins. If we are lucky, just barely peeking a toe over the finish line into the black. In my nearly 30 year career as a director, I've been privy to a lot of museum balance sheets. And I promise you, it's not a pretty picture, even in healthy times. And the larger museums have the same problems as the small ones. I used to joke that there are two museum gods in the sky playing dice every day. In the morning, you receive word of an unrestricted bequest. And in the afternoon, the chillers fail. Even though most of us can barely achieve a balanced budget, galleries and storage are overflowing, staff members are stretched too thin and paid too little, and yet we still talk only about growth, more buildings, new acquisitions, expanded storage, and more staff to handle it all. Our metrics of success are focused on growth, not the impact that we make in serving our missions. Museum directors perpetuate the problem and trustees continue to hold us accountable to the standard of more. Say expansion in a boardroom and trustees lean forward and pulses race. I learned a lesson at the last museum I directed just before I arrived in 2006, the museum completed a $100 million capital campaign, adding a new building and a $50 million endowment for acquisitions. Leadership expected this new century project to increase attendance substantially. In fact, it had no effect at all on attendance. We went on to change our programming, embraced new technology, changed exhibition strategy, focused on community, and attendance more than doubled. To be clear, the goal wasn't to increase attendance. It was to do really good work. And people voted with their feet and with their time. Now, curators who have worked with me over the years 
are all rolling their eyes right now because I really love to acquire art. I am part of the problem. We shouldn't stop acquiring altogether, of course, but we cannot afford to continue to grow at our 20th century pace. And we should shift our metrics, values, and resources away from inputs to outcomes and impacts. Many of the root causes of climate change, including loss of natural habitats and expanding disease vectors, also increase the risks of pandemics. Museums are certainly participating in the gradual destruction of the environment. Most of us have aged buildings, have I mentioned deferred maintenance, that were never built for sustainability and consume vast quantities of energy with astonishing inefficiency. Our staff travels nonstop and art is moved by truck and airplane every day all over the globe. Exhibitions are constructed and demolished every three months. The global pandemic was my wake up call and I'm ashamed that it took COVID-19 for me to realize my own personal and professional responsibility. My architect husband is a specialist in sustainable design and he can ruin any dinner party with horrific data and predictions for environmental catastrophe. Perhaps in response, I built a very comfortable wall around myself, constructed with not in my lifetime thinking, the last few years of wildfires, epic storms, global warming, rising seas, human migration, and a pandemic have changed my thinking. And I realize that we are seeing the real effects of the climate crisis impact museum operations. I've come to understand that as leader of the National Gallery of Art, reducing our carbon footprint and embedding sustainable thinking in everything we do is our responsibility, and certainly my responsibility. Art museums are so good at considering the lives of people who came before us. Who doesn't wanna talk about life in the 17th century? But we don't wanna think about the generations of people who will come after us. Empathy scholar Roman Krasnarek wrote that, quote, we have colonized the future. In wealthy countries especially, we treat it like a distant outpost where we can freely dump ecological damage and technological risk as if there was nobody there, end quote. The last few years have shown me that we are indeed living through a disaster in slow motion and the impact financial and otherwise on museums will only increase and at an exponential rate. We at the gallery are ready to put our pandemic disaster plan and lessons learned analysis on the shelf, but it will remain refreshed and within easy reach as climate change impact is with museums to stay and it will continue to strain operations into the future. The final topic I want to raise is changing American demographics. Between 1910 and 1950, the sort of golden age for the founding of our museums, America was roughly 90% white. In 1990, when I entered the field, America was 80% white. Museums started to get serious about diversity in 2010, when the US was 72.4% white. Today, America is 60% white, and by around 2040, in just 20 years, America will be majority people of color. Given American demographics for the first 50 years of museum operations, one can understand why our historical collections look the way that they do. That was then, but this is now, and the now is urgent, it's challenging, and it is really exciting. As America changes, so too must its museums. We cannot simply make statements of solidarity and talk about our commitment to diversity. Museums must be different. We must prioritize diversifying our collections and be ready to look anew at the canon, especially those artists who have been excluded. 
Museums are starting to tell new stories about the works in our collections and include different voices in doing so. We will hire a diverse staff at all levels of the organization, recruiting in new ways and thinking about jobs differently. Museums must diversify our boards and ensure that BIPOC trustees sit on our finance and strategic planning committees, helping to make decisions about priorities and resources. We need to welcome new patrons and donors. And in our role as community advocates, we should be sure that we are working with BIPOC owned and led businesses and consultants. And we must be confident and humble enough to hear the tough stuff and internalize it. I've learned to recognize that our audiences are diverse in every way, and many come to us with a lived experience which is different from mine as a white woman of privilege and one who was not born digital. To be and to remain relevant, we must have empathy for our audiences and stakeholders. It is a time for museums to move from statements to material change in what we do and how we do it. It means normalizing the inclusion of historically marginalized voices in our work of collecting, exhibiting, and interpreting art, and from the very beginning of exhibitions and projects. Hearing other people's stories and learning about their values, emotions, and life experiences makes us better people and also better art historians. After all, art is the expression of what it is to be human. Moreover, an argument for listening and compassion is not an argument against curatorial expertise. The National Gallery is justifiably known for the depth and rigor of its scholarship. We must recognize, however, that excellent museum scholarship is always in service of something greater, expanding our understanding, firing curiosity, answering difficult questions, and drawing deeper connections between people and art. By listening to a range of voices, we can critically assess what is heard to better understand and shape what needs to come next. Museums do not simply preserve and protect masterpieces in empty rooms. We open our doors literally and figuratively because we believe creating opportunities to experience the works of art works of art and gain, and gain a deeper understanding of them and our shared humanity will make a difference to people. In America today, we talk a lot about healing and about coming together, but we rarely talk about how we are going to do so. The world does not always fit in the binary framework of right, wrong, for, against. As our global, noisy and digital world has become more complicated, we let ourselves assume that being for something necessarily means that you are against its opposite. By ignoring nuance and the gray areas in between points of view, we close ourselves to others and create a limited worldview. Retreating to our different sides, we stop listening deeply to one another and seek validation from like minds. One perspective does not negate or discredit the other. Art is messy and unresolved because people are messy and unresolved. Like all businesses, museums exist in their own constructed dominant logic. This phrase from the business world refers to the historical basis for the ideas about operating models and growth held by a company or industry. Dominant logic provides a sort of mental map of assumptions and, and outlines necessary structures, norms, and strategies for success. In the business world, holding a static dominant logic, guarding it too closely and for too long can result in business irrelevance or a competitor coming in with a disruption that will ultimately harness or destroy your business. Think Kodak, Blockbuster, Sears. Of course, nobody in their right mind wants to hijack our business model. So what's the possible future danger to us? Irrelevance, declining audience, 
staff unrest, community protests, financial disaster, museums literally underwater because of climate disaster, and museums selling parts of the collection to fund operating costs. Marshall Goldsmith wrote an excellent leadership book titled, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. He argues that a certain set of leadership skills often leads people to leadership positions. But once people become leaders, they actually need different skills to be effective leaders. It's also a lesson for the field. Our 20th century museum model brought us extraordinary growth and success. It got us here. But to go to the next level of success, to get there, we need to think differently. Leaving the museum in a better place than we found it doesn't only mean acquiring masterpieces and building new wings. It means ensuring that we leave institutions that are sustainable financially with robust appeal to future audiences and resilient, responsible environmental stewards. We will spend the days ahead talking about deaccessioning. But I urge you all to think more deeply about the issues that are causing this moment and ask yourselves, are we just rearranging the deck chairs? The good news is that we oversee our future and doing so with courage, empathy, creativity, and curiosity will get us there. Thank you. Thank you, Kaywin, for joining us this morning and for your candid and insightful remarks. You've certainly and effectively set the stage for the many conversations that will happen today and tomorrow. There is much more ahead and we look forward to what the symposium has in store. We do have a full day of sessions, but there will be brief breaks in between those sessions. Please remember that to join each session, you must use the dedicated link for that session. Again, those links are in the symposium agenda, which you were sent and should have in PDF format. If you have trouble logging in, email Carly, K-A-R-L-Y, at kmgproductionsny.com. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.